Welcome to the Pregnancy Help Podcast. I'm Christine Grimmett, and since April is Abortion Recovery Awareness Month, uh, we here at Heartbeat International feel it's so important to talk about those personal stories of those who have in some way been affected by an abortion decision so that we can bring special awareness to the healing and the forgiveness and how there is help available even though each person's story is unique. So here with me is my colleague, Sarah Dominguez. Sarah does many amazing things here at Heartbeat International through our ministry services team. And some of that work includes a focus in abortion recovery programs within pregnancy centers. So Sarah, I'll turn things over to you and let you bring in our episode guest. Thanks so much, Christine. It's great to be here today. And again, we are just so grateful to all of those who are doing amazing work in the field of abortion recovery, especially celebrating that this month in April, having it be Abortion Recovery Awareness Month. So joined with us today, we have an amazing story of healing. And when I spoke with this person, one thing that stood out to me was he shared that my story isn't about a man healing from abortion. My story is about God's mercy. And I can't wait for Jeff Joquin to share a little bit more about his story. And it is just truly an honor to get to um, hear these stories and of course, share them with our affiliates. So Jeff, welcome to the podcast and share a little bit about yourself. Yeah, absolutely, Sarah and Christine. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, Jeff Joquin, live in Tampa, Florida, with my beautiful wife, Sandy, of uh, 23 years, and my daughter, Faith McKenzie, who's 20 years old, and my son, Jonathan Andrew, who would be 36 years old today if he were alive. I was born and raised in Dartmouth, Massachusetts, and spent the first 26 years of my life up there. And then my wife and I moved down here in 1996, and We've been enjoying the beautiful Florida sunshine since then. So that's a little bit about me. Excellent. Well, I understand that you've got a very powerful story and any opportunity that we have to really give a platform to these stories of abortion healing, we love to do that. So Jeff, would you open us up and really help us understand where your story begins? Yeah. Yeah, my story begins in July of 1987, Sarah. Um, I was getting ready, uh, was a high school football player, getting ready to go off to college and and hopefully pursue a career in the NFL. And all of my thoughts and actions were geared towards that. And then my girlfriend at the time, uh, that was back before cell phones. So she called me at home and I picked up the phone. And, you know, on the other line, I heard, you know, she was very quiet at first. And then she said, you know, Jeff, we have a problem. And all I could think about Sarah and Christine were, you know, all the things that I would miss out on. Even before she told me what the problem was, I, I kind of already felt in my heart what it was. And, and my selfish emotions just started to rage inside of me. But I was able to keep them quiet. And she told me, you know, Jeff, we, we're pregnant. And, you know, Sarah and Christine, I, as a little backdrop, I have a brother who's five years older than me. And when he got into high school, he got his girlfriend pregnant. And that was a big black eye on my parents. You know, we were raised in a good Catholic Christian family. And so for one of their sons to get a girl pregnant before marriage, it was a really big black eye. But by God's graces, my brother decided to to have his child and get married. Um, You know, so he made the right decision. But when I got into high school, my parents were very, very, made it very, um, known to me that if I made the same kind of mistake that my brother made, you know, that they'd castrate me is the word that my mother used in a, in a nice and kind and loving way. Um, but I entered into high school knowing that I had to be very careful. So when I received that phone call in the third week of July of 1987, and my girlfriend told me that she was pregnant, all the fear and anxiety that you can imagine welled up inside of me. And instead of accepting, you know, instead of being a man and stepping forward and accepting the responsibility of being a father, I told my girlfriend that I needed 24 hours to think about it. So 24 hours later, I called her up, Sarah, and I, I told her I wasn't ready to be a father. I didn't ask her what her opinion was. I didn't ask her what her feelings were. I just told her I wasn't ready to be a father. Um, So I told her, set up the abortion, tell me how much it costs and set the appointment up, preferably out of town, 
you know, because the local high school football star can't be seen at abortion clinic. So about a day later, uh, Sarah, she set up the appointment in Providence, Rhode Island, which is about 45 minutes away. I borrowed the $200 from a friend and I picked her up that morning. And I'll never forget driving down. So not only did I not ask her what her feelings were about this child in her womb, but all the way down to Providence, Rhode Island, 45 minute drive, I did not say one word to her. I did not have the courage to console her, to support her. I did not say a single word to her. I pulled up to the Porta Cache in this woman's health center, I think it was called, what a joke that is. And, and she looked at me as she left the car and she said, are you gonna come in there with me? And I remember looking at her, cowardly decision number three, I looked at her and I said, no, I have no intentions of going in. I might know someone in there or somebody in there might know me. And so she went into the abortion clinic and I pulled into the parking lot. And I can remember, Christine, sorry, it was again, July, third week of July, 1987. I had a Chevy Malibu that didn't have air conditioning. It was very hot and I was sweating profusely sitting in the car in the parking lot. And I can remember for the first time in this entire process, I, refl I, I remember reflecting and I looked up at the top of the, the roof of the vehicle, which was my way of looking up at God. And I remember saying to God, God, is this what hell's gonna feel like? Because my conscience deep down inside knew I was making a bad decision. But all I could think about was my future. At that point in time in my life, you know, the Holy Trinity was me, myself, and I. It wasn't the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So it was easy for me to just focus on me. And, but, but in that brief instant, in that brief instance, God, he, I know he entered into my heart. Even though the decision was made, and even though I wouldn't let him in, he tried to enter my heart to tell me the decision I was making was grave and mortal, but he still loved me. Mm, that's powerful. So my girlfriend, she came out of the, 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 the abortion clinic. Uh, the nurse gave us pain medicine for her. I drove her all the way home, didn't say a word all the way home either, dropped her off. And the next day I called her up and I broke up with her thinking that I was going to put this issue behind me. But that's, that's my, that was my, really the way I look at it now, Sarah and Christine, that was the beginning of my pro-life experience. As crazy as that sounds, that was, that was God. Even though I had gone into the pits of hell and made a horrific decision, he still found a way to touch my heart in that day in a meaningful manner. And I look back at it now and see what, what his uh, intentions were by doing that. I think that is just so profound and powerful. Something you shared just really hit me. And I think it's something that probably hit our listeners too. And I'm going to be sitting with this at least for the rest of the day, maybe for the rest of Lent, because that is the season that we're in right now. But you had talked about how in that moment, sitting in the car, it was clear that the decision that you were making was grave, but that God still loved you. And I think that is a message that we will sit with as humans for our entire existence on this earth, because to fathom that level of unconditional love is so profound. So I love if you could just speak a little bit more to, you know, where did those seeds that were planted on that day lead you? So where has your abortion healing begun and where has it led? Yeah, great question, Sarah. You know, the even though God reached into that difficult situation and touched my heart, as men, I did a tremendous job after that day of burying my emotion and burying that fear and burying that anxiety. As men, what we do, we build gigantic walls up around ourselves so that we can keep our emotions in and we can keep everyone out. So I really, to be honest with you, I had completely forgot about the abortion for many, many, many years because I went off into college, Sarah, and, and you know, and, and, and was a two-time preseason All-American. 
and had the Buffalo Bills come to a couple of my football games. So I was so preoccupied with how great I was and quite frankly, how good of a decision that was to not have to deal with a son or a daughter Mm. that I, I was so preoccupied with me that I couldn't process that I had put a woman through the unthinkable. Mm -hmm. that I had not supported her, that I had taken her dignity away. And and here I am with, you know, living life on a pedestal, burying all my emotions. Um, So I did a tremendous job, Sarah, of burying my emotions and my perspective on that day, really, quite frankly, until my early 30s. Mm. Yeah. Tell me more about what shifted in your early thirties. Cause I think that's a really common experience that we hear in pregnancy help organizations that those who have an abortion experience may not necessarily experience any sort of regret or negative emotional impact or spiritual impact for years and years and years. Though certainly we do know of women who do experience regret, even in the parking lot after having begun an abortion or experienced an abortion. So this experience that you're sharing about having, you know, sounds like decades or at least a decade passing um, between the abortion experience and your experience of needing or seeking recovery. Um, So what, what shifted for you? Yeah, you know, um, I knew deep down inside, you know, the prophet Jeremiah says, uh, why is my pain continuous, my wound incurable, refusing to be healed? Even though I didn't process the pain, Sarah, it was there. It was always there. Okay. So in my mid-20s, I got married uh, to my beautiful wife, Sandy. Uh, and then in our, um, around 30, we got married. And then certainly uh, soon thereafter, we decided we were going to have a family. We wanted to have a family. And month after month of failed pregnancy tests, I started thinking to myself, you know, was this the God of the Old Testament, you know, the flood for the people of the time of Noah or the plagues and pestilence for the people of Egypt? Was this God's way of punishing me? Uh, the infertility and not being able to have a child. And I can remember, sir, as if it were this morning, my wife and I had to pursue um, a fertility doctor. And I can remember at the age of, I think it was either 31 or 32, I was kneeling down in an exam room in a fertility doctor's office, looking up, at God again, probably for the first time since I did in my Chevy Malibu that day in 1987, and saying, God, please, I understand that I haven't yet apologized for that abortion. I understand I haven't taken responsibility for it. I understand I haven't apologized for it. But could you please bless us with a child? Mm. it, It took me literally 14 years And it was only because I needed something from God that I allowed myself to process the fact that, you know, taking the life of an unborn child in 1987 may have had everything to do with the fact why we were infertile in our early 30s. But, you know, God, the God of mercy, you know, you said it at the beginning. My story is a story of drugs. It's a story of alcohol. It's a story of a failed NFL career, abortion, workaholism. It's a story of many things, but it is a story above all about God's mercy. Mm-hmm. And do you know that the God of mercy, even before I asked for forgiveness for taking one of his unborn children, he blessed us with Faith Mackenzie Joquin on November 22nd of the year 2002. And we named her Faith, not because of a country Western singer or some Hollywood star, but from Hebrews 11.1, which is faith is the realization of what is hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. God, even though I treated him like a vending machine, he still blessed us with a child. Mm, That's powerful. And I think all of us can sit and and resonate with that, regardless of what our history is or our story holds, the reality of coming to God, needing something. And I think 
at least I can speak for myself, this expectation that I'm being met by this vengeful, like you described Old Testament God, but how amazing to realize that what I'm actually being met with or who I'm actually being met with is so merciful and so perfectly loving, even more than I could ever love and how much hope that gives. And I think the word that we haven't used here yet is, is redeeming. There's so much redemption here in your story. So I love to know where, where did this lead? You know, you receive this redemptive story. You experience the joy of fatherhood um, through faith, though we know that there's more to that story and we'll get to that. Um, but tell us more about where this has led since you, when, since you really knelt down a second time. I love that parallel between looking up at the sky from the abortion clinic to looking up in the infertility clinic and how powerful that is that God was present in both of those moments in your life. So tell us more. Yeah, thank, thank God he doesn't operate in time, right, mm-hmm. Sarah? He, he operates in the eternity because even after he blessed my wife and I with a daughter, I got mad at God, right? Every time I looked out the back window of my, of my house and saw my next door neighbor playing soccer with his son, every time I drove by the baseball field and saw a father walking out of the baseball field with his arm around his son, it would make me mad. It would make me angry that God didn't have another child in his basket of tricks because my wife and I were only able to have one child. And and that child is, is the greatest gift outside my wife I've ever received. I love her beyond measure, Mm -hmm. but I could not have the son that I wanted. So, so I turned away from God for another probably six to seven years and dove into workaholism, a new addiction for me. And I was really resentful at God, even though I had never asked for forgiveness. He had given me a beautiful wife and a child. I was resentful to him. I was resentful to him until one day, Sarah, I will tell you this. I was kneeling in the chapel, kind of like my late 30s, when I started to really take my faith seriously. I remember kneeling in the chapel at uh, Our Lady of the Rosary Parish in Land Lakes, Florida. And I remember saying to God, this is now at the age of 40. And I remember looking up at the crucifix and saying to God, you know, God, I'm so very thankful that you've given me all the blessings that you've given me in my life. But why couldn't you have given me a son? And, you know, Sarah, I felt the weight of eternity fall on my chest. And I believe I heard the God of the universe say to me, He said, Jeff, I did give you a son. And he's standing right here next to me. Mm. And you can only imagine how much both of us love you. Wow. So it, 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 it is crippling to me to think that for 25 years of my life, from the age of 17 years old to the early 40s, probably 41, 42, my relationship with God was limited in one, in one direction. As long as God was giving me what I wanted, then I respected him. When he didn't give me what I wanted, I ignored him. Hmm. And, but, but that's really kind of the point in my life where I transitioned towards really getting healing from him. And I'm sure we'll talk about the, that here uh, uh, in short order. Yeah, I think the one thing that I take from what you should, I shouldn't say the one thing, there are so many things that I'm sitting with, with what you just shared, but how amazing to think of the ways that God has already blessed us that we don't even know. Like you had had this desire for a son and had prayed for a son. And it wasn't until later that he really revealed that he has blessed you with that reality. And that hasn't changed. Um, despite our imperfect decisions, that blessing is still intact and still there. All of the grace that comes with that is there. And his timing is perfect. You know, again, he didn't necessarily reveal that after your abortion, days after, months after. It took years for him to reveal that blessing, but it doesn't diminish the fact that that has always been his blessing for you. How powerful. 
Yeah, yeah. His his plan, Jeremiah 1 4 says, I knew you before I formed you in the womb, right? From the very beginning of time, the God of the universe knew that Jeff Matthew Joquin was going to have two children. One would be named Faith Mackenzie Joquin, and the other one was be named Jonathan Andrew Joquin. Mm. But the part that that I see, that's the, the, the real evil behind abortion, because at 17 years old, I decided that God's plan did not fit into my life as opposed to fitting my life into God's plan. I thought I was given up an NFL career and what God in his infinite wisdom was saying, Jeff, you're giving up your beloved son. Mm. And, and but he again, I think what the pro-life movement in total needs to understand, it is always about God's mercy. It is unlimited and it's unwarranted, but it's he always those poor, innocent young ladies that walk into the pregnancy center whose spineless boyfriends don't even have the courage to come in. They need to see God's mercy. If you can show them God's mercy, and sometimes that's opening up your broken heart to them. If you can show them God's mercy, God wins Mm. because he plants a seed in that heart. And even if that beautiful young woman who's been abandoned by her boyfriend doesn't keep her baby, she knows one thing, that that day she met Jesus Christ whether she's Christian, non-Christian, you know, Jewish, Muslim, she met Jesus in the person of that woman at the pregnancy clinic that day. And it will change her life. For me, it took 25 years. For her, hopefully, it will, it'll help her make the right decision. If she doesn't make the right decision, hopefully, it'll, it'll, it, that seed planted in her heart will let her know that God doesn't want to judge her for that decision. God doesn't judge us for decision. He judges us when we cross over from this life to the next. But those women coming in that are fearful, they just need to see God's mercy. And if we can do that, we can continue to turn the tide on this great evil that is abortion. I think you just... Hit the nail on the head as far as what our collective vision is when it comes to pregnancy help is really expanding the true message and really a hopeful message that there is mercy for all of us, wherever we're at, whatever, whatever baggage we carry into that pregnancy center or maternity home that we're being met with exactly what you're describing, a God of mercy and a God who loves us even more than we can love ourselves in many moments of our lives. So thank you so much for um, really highlighting the importance of that. Now, we know that there are so many different avenues when it comes to abortion healing. So I'm curious to know, what did your avenue look like? Where, if you could kind of describe for us what that journey was like for you? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'll be quick with that because I think what's important is the fruits that have come from that. Sure. But for me, for me in my early 40s, I went to the, uh, I did a general confession. Uh, being Catholic Christian, I did a general confession, went into the confessional. Hour and 15 minutes later, I finally, after 25 years, had to confess to the Almighty God that I had taken the life of one of his children in the womb. And when that confessional was over, the priest gave me absolution, Sarah. He came, I was crying. He was crying. He came out of the confessional, gave me a big hug, and he said, welcome home, son. And, and I, I tell you, I can't, it's hard to explain the grace that came on me that day um, in the loving and forgiveness that came on me that day. But that was really my first step of the, of the journey of my personal healing. Um, the second step was, was sharing that abortion with my current wife, mm-hmm. my only wife that I've had. At that point in time, it was, um, I would say, probably 12 or 13 years into our marriage. And I shared the abortion with her 
that I had had with a previous girlfriend so many years before. And that, that was that was fearful for me, Sarah. You know, even though I love this woman and shared everything with her, I still had one secret left in the secret bag. And when I shared that with her, she just like, I'm six foot three, 260 pounds. Okay. My wife is five foot four, 120 pounds. And I'm scared to death of her. I always have been. Because she takes no nonsense. She takes no BS. She leads me to Christ in every way possible. So sharing this with her, she now helped me carry my burden, right? So that was a huge step in in my personal recovery process. The third step for me was naming my child. You know, and I know a lot of your listeners probably This is going to sound familiar to them if they've dealt with Rachel's vineyard before. But I never, I, I, my, the only vineyard I dealt with is the vineyard from heaven. Mm. I got, I, God told me what I needed to do. And, and it took long enough for me to accept it. But I started implementing those steps. So I, I named my son not long after that, that, um, the story I told you in the chapel, I named him. You know, Jonathan Andrew Joaquin, because it was written on the inside of my heart what his name was. Mm. I had been carrying that for 25 years, his name. So now I have a relationship with him. I have a surrogate in heaven. Mm -hmm. I pray to him every morning. My feet do not hit the ground without asking him to pray for me. And I'll become a better father, a better husband, a better minister. So having a relationship with my son, that was profound for me. But I'll be honest with you, Sarah. At that point in time, I had I'd gotten a spiritual director, and he was following me on this healing process. And I went into him one day, and he said, Jeff, he said, I have the next step for you on your healing journey. And I said, okay, Father Ed, what's that? He said, you need to call up your former girlfriend and apologize to her. And I, and I tell you, Christine and Sarah, I, I got knocked back in my chair. I think I fell back over into the hallway. And I said to him, I said, Father Ed, you're, you're a spiritual genius. But what good could come out of that? And all he said to me was, Jeff, if you think that you've carried a lot of pain in your heart for the last 25, 26 years, can you imagine how much pain that woman has carried in her heart. And I walked out of that spiritual direction that day. I went home. I, I, I it, you know, uh, spoke with my beautiful wife and, 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 um, and got her a blessing. And, and, and then, you know, again, I find myself in the chapel praying to God saying, okay, God, is this something you want me to do? And I said, if this is something you want me to do, you're going to have to help me because it's been almost 30 years now since the abortion. I don't know where this girl lives. I don't know how to get a hold of her. I said, but you open up the doors and, and, I'll, and I'll walk through them, God. I, I'm not going to ignore you any longer. So two days later, I reach out to my friend. One day later, he gives me my former girlfriend's phone number. And I call her the next day. And I tell you, I'm, I'm 53 years old now. And I have never had a conversation that impacted me more profoundly than that one did. If I thought I was scared going into the confessional in my early 40s, if I thought I was scared um, driving to the abortion clinic that in when I was 17, that phone call with my former girlfriend, I was trembling in fear because I had that same liar. You know, the enemy, the devil, the one that told me that I was doing the right thing at 17 years old. He kept telling me, you don't have to apologize to her. It's not her, your problem. It's her problem. But, but again, God's mercy shone over and, and through that. And, and I picked up the phone and called her. And I, and I said to her after a, a very awkward introduction after 30 years, I said to her, could you please forgive me for putting you in an unthinkable position and not being there to support you when I put you in that unthinkable position? 
and I was crying, and, and, and I think she was too. But she, she forgave me. She just needed a man to step up in her life and take responsibility and, and, and acknowledge the mistake that I had made. So that, that was the next step in, the, in my personal recovery process. And that set me free, Sarah and Christine, like, like, like almost no other step had. Because now I had undone the wrong that I had done. God had forgiven me. My wife is my support mechanism. My son was praying for me. But the grave wrong that I had done to that poor girl, I wasn't in there with my feet up in stirrups and some stranger doing the unthinkable. I wasn't, I didn't have to go through that, but she did. So that, that you know, asking her for forgiveness, that set me free in ways I cannot even explain to you. But again, then the last part of the healing journey for me as an individual, Sarah, because I was still, even after all those steps, I, I still felt pain. I hadn't forgiven myself. I hadn't. So I remember sitting in the chapel again. That's where I get all of, you know, you keep hearing that. But again, that's where I, I get, if you want to get, if you want to get words of wisdom from God, you got to go to his house. And when you go to his house, just be ready for what he has to say to you. And I'll never forget this time. I said, God, when am I possibly ever going to forgive myself for the, for the, for what I did so many years before? And I, he hit me again in the chest. And he said, look up, Jeff. And I looked up and he said, what do you think these scars are for, Jeff? What is the purpose behind these scars? These scars are for your healing, Jeff. So now what I need you to do is take your scars so that you can bring them and get other people healing. And that, I was not ready for that. I really wasn't. But right after that, he pounded me with scripture again, sir. Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. And that was when I knew in my mid to late 40s, that was when I knew with certainty that the only way I get my healing is by going and entering into someone else's pain mm. and giving them healing. That's when I get my healing. I think that that is the thing that kept sitting with me as you're sharing multiple moments in your journey is how the enemy loves to isolate us because when we're isolated, it's so easy for us to be distracted by the voice that's leading us to do the unspeakable as a 17 year old or whatever age. And there were three moments to me that that isolation really stood out. The first being you in your mind had an unspeakable sin that you couldn't even share with your wife. And again, isolating you, whether you realized it or not into that decision, it was all for yourself and for your, like your own isolated experience. Um, the second being the lie that you don't need to approach your former girlfriend and, you know, consider her healing and the need there um, and whatever that journey looks like for her. But again, further isolating you from that collective experience. But how amazing when you were able to break through in prayer to see the value of sharing your story, which is the opposite of isolation. It's building mm -hmm. community. It's building um, really a circle of support that isn't just about you, right? It's about people that also are carrying a similar experience in their own lives and how powerful that is. It's almost like the, the antonym of isolation. It's as if God loves us to be relational or something. Who knew? Who knew? Yeah, yeah. I think that's really powerful. And it leads really well into the next question I wanted to ask, which is how is God using your story to empower life? Would love to know more about what he's doing in that. Yeah. You know, I could sit here for the next um, two hours and give you 30 examples of how God's ministry, the abortion healing ministry to men in the ways that he's manifested healing through men, whether that was an 82 year old man in Pittsburgh at a men's conference who 60 years before had had an abortion, 60 years before. 
or the man from, I think it was Tampa, Florida, who has four children, but he had two children. Then he and his wife lost their jobs. They had two abortions mm. before their third and fourth children. This man approached me after my talk at a, at a retreat. And he was, I, it's hard to explain what happens when a man comes out of that darkness. His body is shaking. He's trembling. He's sweating. He said, do you know that because you had the courage to tell me about your abortion, I am going to go home right now and I am going to get on my knees and I'm going to apologize to my wife of 45 years. I've never apologized to my wife for making her have two abortions. I could go on and on about stories about men, but, but really what I want to do because of the audience listening, I want to talk about two real quick stories about women because in my infinite ignorance for the last two to three years, I thought that my ministry was to men, but you know, again, I'm ignorant. God is infinite. You know, there, I've got the opportunity, Sarah, to speak at uh, uh, high schools. And then in, in particular, I've got to speak at two um, high schools that were co-ed, one on the St. Pete side and one on the Tampa side. And I'd like to tell you a real quick story about both of those. So I'm sitting in the, the, the high school, the co-ed high school over in St. Petersburg, and I get done with my story. And you can tell that that people, you know, are very impacted at the end of it. It's always been the same way. God gets the credit. I don't. So the principal said, Jeff, if you could stand off on the side, because I know people are going to want to approach you. OK, so I stood off on the side and and all the teenage boys walked by and kind of gave me the, you know, because part of my story is the, the NFL, the NFL career. And they want to talk about that part. You know, how much would you have made? What position did you play? Blah, 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 blah. Did you know this person or that person who played for Buffalo at the time? But it was the group of three girls that walked by together and they stood off at a distance. But the one in the middle, God had me focus on. And I looked at her and Sarah, she looked right through my soul. She, she wasn't looking in my eyes. She looked right through my soul. She had a tear running down her right cheek. She rubbed her stomach and she mouthed the words, thank you. Wow. That was God with a story of a man telling his perspective on an abortion. It helped her make the decision that I didn't make when I was 17 years old. So I left that day and I said, God, I said, I am an unworthy instrument, okay? I'm just a pencil, but I want you to write the love story. Mm. So keep writing the love story. And, and, then, and then switching gears, I spoke at a co-ed retreat for high school students in, um, over on the Tampa side. And this was kind of like in a, um, a campground setting, Sarah. So it was perfect because after I got done with the talk to the couple hundred kids then what the what the priest did is they had me sit way on the side in a little picnic table right and then far enough away where people couldn't see who was going over to talk to me but close enough where it felt comfortable for for those to come over and do you know all it was was one young lady after another young lady after another young lady and I was sitting there listening to this story, Sarah, and I want to be very careful not to share too much of their stories. But halfway through it, I said, God, fill me with wisdom here. Help me to speak to these beautiful young ladies who are in front of me. I was picturing my former girlfriend from 1987 sitting in front of me. And all I could hear from their heart, Sarah, was thank you for giving a face to that, that boyfriend who left me. Mm. Thank you for showing emotion because the boyfriend that left me couldn't, but seeing you show that emotion gave me a sense of comfort. 
these young ladies were comforted by the fact that a man was standing in front of them, taking responsibility, accepting responsibility for being a coward and not standing up for his girlfriend. And it gave them comfort for me doing that for them. So it, it, I always thought that my mission was to help post-supportive men. I realize now that above all, God wants me in the, in the pre-abortive mission field mm -hmm. because the, the, the easiest way to not suffer from a grave mortal sin is to not commit it. Mm -hmm. um, but but the, the ministry to, again, we all have to remember, even though it's, it's mostly women that show up to the pregnancy centers, it takes both of them to heal. And I never realized that until I, until I got my healing with my former girlfriend 30 years after it happened. I think it's, it, it sits with me and it's such a special thing that God uses stories. It's a specialty, right? He, he writes these stories and we have a pen in our hands too. And it's our opportunity to let him dictate how he wants the story to go, or we can kind of go rogue and make decisions. But ultimately to use that word again, he loves redemptive endings. He loves stories that bring back the reader or the person experiencing that story to him. And so how grateful we are that you were willing to share yours in such a profound way. And it sounds like the way God is using that is for his mercy and for redemption. Not It spans beyond our, our own lives, right? And again, that's the opposite of isolation, that yeah. our stories can impact the lives and stories of other people just as much as we can be impacted by the lives and stories of others as well. And I think that's something that is so characteristic of this work that we do in the pregnancy help movement. And also, I, I think, it's so interesting because when we do podcasts, we have an idea of where things are going to go. But for me, sitting here and talking with you, and this isn't the first time we've talked. So to, to be here today and talking with you, I think there's no accident that in the month of April, Abortion Recovery Awareness Month, that we are entering into this dialogue about really bringing to light the things that we feel as if are unspeakable, the things that isolate us. In this instance, it's abortion and how powerful it can be when we do allow the Lord to shed light on that in whatever way, in whatever capacity he does, because it's different for everyone. But I just want to thank you so much for sharing your profound story. Um, and ultimately it's God's story, right? He is writing this and you are so obedient to share it in the way that you do. So we are grateful to have been able to share this with you today. Could I just close with one Bible verse? Absolutely. Isaiah chapter 43, verse four. This is the God of the universe speaking to each one of us, every one of his children. He says, you are precious in my eyes and honored, and I love you. Mm. Amen. What more, what more needs to be said? I love that. That's what I'll be sitting with for the rest of the day. And God I think that you. is... Something amazing that we all get to take away from today's conversation with Jeff Joquin. Thank you so much, Jeff, for being with us today, sharing your story. And again, to all of those that are serving in the pregnancy help movement, especially those that are working in the abortion recovery field, thank you. Thank you for your many different avenues of healing that you are opening up for those men and women that are experiencing heartache after abortion. And I can list off a couple ideas. I mean, there's retreats there's Bible studies, there's small groups, there's one-on-one -on -one therapy. There's so many different ways that we can encounter God's healing, um, especially after abortion. So for those that are working in that field, we thank you. We definitely want to be sure that we highlight the different places that we can go as members of the Pregnancy Help Movement to look for abortion recovery opportunities, whether it be for our clients or even for ourselves. At heartbeatservices.org, we have our life Links landing page. And at Life Links, you can actually click the button for abortion recovery. And there you will find many different opportunities 
for abortion recovery in that field. So we encourage you to go there. We also at Heartbeat International and our Heartbeat Academy have training opportunities in the field of abortion recovery. So if you're looking to bring abortion recovery to your organization directly, you can look for training opportunities at Heartbeat Academy. And I'm going to turn it over to Christine and see what else she'd like to share with us today. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. And again, Jeff, thank you so much. You have such a personal story, and I just appreciate that you're willing to share that with so many through uh, your in-person speaking, through the podcast, through YouTube videos. Um, I did have the chance to watch the full video, and I know there there is more to your story that we didn't have time to go through um, all of the pieces. And so I would encourage people to watch that. But you also have a pretty exciting opportunity coming up Uh, that you mentioned through EWTN. Can you tell us a little bit about that and how we can keep an eye out for that coming out, I believe, this summer? Yes. um, Helmut Goody with Stellar Cinematics, what he's done, he's traveled the country and he's interviewed 30 different people that are at different spectrums of the pro-life movement, whether it's some are doctors, some are nurses, some are pregnancy center directors, and some are poor schmucks like me that you know made a bad decision many years before. And what he's done is he's done a um, a sixty minute segment on each one of those uh, speak thirty speakers, and they're in the process of getting somebody to narrate it right now and put the whole package together. And then they're in the process as well of negotiating with EWTN to kind of put that. Um, on a, you know, they'll have it as a month long series where they'll have one speaker each day doing their 60 minute blurb on um, their perspective on the pro-life movement. So hopefully what my understanding is, is it's going to be ready in the month of March. Um, uh, so it would be re- it would have been ready last month um, and then it'll be ready probably hopefully in May, June ish or maybe towards the summer or fall. For, from a production standpoint. Wonderful. Well, you know, it takes those stories. It takes the everybody in the pro-life movement. That's what's so cool about the pro-life movement is that ha- we have people from all over, different backgrounds, different reasons for being active in the pro-life movement. And so we're grateful that you're a part of it. Um, it really has been a blessing to speak with you today and to hear your story. Um, and to our listeners, I'll put links for the Life Links page for the abortion recovery resources, as well as the training link for Heartbeat Academy in the show notes. So be sure to check those out. And as always, subscribe so that you never miss an episode. So with that, I thank you all for listening to this episode of the Pregnancy Help Podcast.